Uh, welcome, folks. Welcome to today. Um, we're celebrating International Democracy Day. This was um, established in 2008 by the United Nations as a way of reminding us to take a check around the world and assess what is the state of democracy. And this year, um, we're joined by a panel here in Burlington, Vermont, to discuss the idea of democracy and what democracy means to you. We have with us Ali Jiang, who is a former Burlington City Councilor, um, a political activist, and a new American leader. Sandy Baird, activist, former state legislator, and city councilor. Oh no, former state legislator, and lawyer. political um, uh, candidate, mm -hmm. and lawyer, activist. Pellen Cohn, who's with us from the Vermont League of Win Women Voters, and also is a city councilor in the city of Montpelier. Yes. Mm -hmm. And C.D. Madison, a political thought leader and former candidate for Burlington mayor, and maybe a candidate in the future. And I would like to just hear from each of you a little bit about maybe just like define for you what democracy means in the context of um, 2024. And we'll start with Sandy. Oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Megan, and thank you for doing this, because to me this is the most important topic facing us as Americans. It is my belief that democracy is not a matter of voting. It's not a matter of the Electoral College. It is a matter, however, of the U.S. Constitution, which I think many years ago established the principles of real democracy, too. One of town meetings, which is direct democracy, and not voting, you don't vote for a candidate or another person to represent your interests. Each citizen in a town meeting has the right to vote for the, by themselves. Town meetings were established in Vermont and other parts of New England. To me, that is direct democracy, which we do not have in the United States. What we have in the United States is a republic, where you vote for people to represent you, um, rather than that you are representing yourself in a town meeting fashion. But secondly, I believe in d that democracy is threatened everywhere because essential freedoms are being um, trampled, including in our country. The most important freedoms that a real democracy has are the freedoms that are outlined in the Bill of Rights. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, freedom to worship or not as you please and in the way that you please, freedom to assemble. All of those Bill of Rights are being trampled right now. Uh, there's serious censorship going on in the press, there's censorship of political debate, there's censorship from our universities. Everywhere there is a, an attempt to control free speech. Without free speech, without that Bill of Rights, you cannot really have a democracy because nobody, therefore, can really speak their minds in a lot of ways. Great. So, so that's my idea of democracy is not who you vote for. It is town meeting where every citizen has the right to express his or her opinions. Great. Thanks. Um, now, C.D. Madison, we're talking about voting. Sandy's talking about direct democracy. You just were a delegate at the mm. Democratic National Convention. Maybe just give us a little sense of what's democracy mean to you, <laughs> um, especially coming out of the energy and excitement of that um, experience. Oh, democracy to me, it's, it's a very powerful concept in the sense that in the United States, when I was born, it was illegal for my parents to be married. My father is black, my mother is white and we were in the state of Georgia. So folks like to talk about states' rights, but in that instance, the state of Georgia determined that I was a bastard. We talk about freedom and democracy. I appreciate that in my lifetime, the Voting Rights Act passed, civil rights passed. We had the opportunity for women to get their own credit, women and all women to vote, not just white women. Um, we have equal marriage now. So I'll tell you what democracy means to me. Democracy means, yes, freedom and freedom from fear. And in order for the United States to have a true democracy, one thing I believe we're lacking right now, and I would go back to Reagan for this, is we lost the fairness doctrine. And we lost the concept of fact and truth. And now we have parties saying to us, alternative facts matter. 
No, I think in order to have a true democracy, we have to have an agreement on what truth is. And really, I understand that people vote out of fear and of feelings, and we need to honor what people do feel. We also need to vote out of facts. What is truth? How do we, in our democracy, have a social contract so that we make life better for all of us? And that's what democracy means to me. Great. Thank you. Helen Cohn, um, and especially following up on the issue of um, how decisions are made and how they affect people personally, either on a local level or something like the Civil Rights Act, where it's coming from a national level, even contrary to how people may want to vote locally. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the League of Women Voters um, brings to this conversation? So. Um, I'm a board member of the League, but I'm also immigrant American. I moved here seven years ago uh, from another country, from Turkey. So uh, I start working with the League because they um, really appreciate the inclusion and civic engagement. And as an immigrant American, for me, that democracy means all voices are heard, right? Because you migrate a new country, you try to become part of that community, and you work very hard, uh, but most of the time you don't see people like yourself in decision-making process. So that's why um, League is trying to make sure that democracy means every individual, regardless of their background, regardless of their economic status, they can have a right and opportunity to participate in the political process. And also, they can receive all the information with transparency. And there should be equality, equality for all the people. And also, um, they can be um, engaged civically. All the decision makings or decision might affect their life. Right, so that's why we start working with the non-U.S. citizen voting, and we are um, doing so many different initiatives to educate Vermont community and also uh, create this right. And people like me uh, come to America, work very hard, pay their taxes. They can have a right in the democracy, and yeah. they can be included. And Montpelier, I think, was the first city yeah. in Vermont to yeah. pass non-citizen yeah. voting. Mm -hmm. And then Burlington was the third after yeah. Winooski. And Ali, you were yep. on at the city council, yep. right, when that happened. And so just maybe give us a little background on what democracy means to you um, on the tail of that idea of non-citizen voting as well. Yep. Thank you, and <clears throat> happy Democracy Day for everyone, the viewers, and happy to share this stage with all of you and thank you for bringing us here today. Um, from my perspective, democracy is a concept in which people who have different beliefs, right, who are very diverse, mm -hmm. should be able to come together and try to find a consensus. Because each and every single one of us, we have our own way of viewing issues in front of us. But now, how do we come together and still respect the perspective of others and try to find a consensus and move us forward as a community. Because we're not animals, we are humans, and animals don't have those type of processes. It's just about who is stronger, will get, will have a say, or, or, or things like that. But here, in this world, in the 21st century, in the United States, in Africa, in elsewhere, we're not on a monarch society. Mm. We are a society in which we need to identify, you know, what are the issues affecting each and every single one of us, and for each and every single one of us to have a say by voting, by speaking up, and also by, you know, trying to advocate for what you believe in, and then we find a consensus and move forward. We are also newcomers. America is different from any other country mm -hmm. around the world. We have here a melting pot, diversity in perspective, gender, right, affirmation or, you know, religious belief, all of it is in here. It's a country in which where democracy is being demonstrated every single day in so many different ways. Societies in, within America are also very different. In Burlington, we are the third 
of all of these municipalities in the state who um, accepted for non-citizens to have a say. Why? Because they pay taxes. Why? Because they have their children in, in the schools. Any decision being made without their perspective into it is going to affect them. So reason why we follow the lead of Winooski and also Montpellier to make it happen. In the beginning, I was a little bit, um, I was not with, with that idea because back then we had a president, Donald Trump, and it was a little bit scary to keep a number of people who are not citizens and who are not voting, reason why I blocked it. But now when we had a new president, Joseph Biden, I said, of course, and so far so good. People are so happy as taxpayers to have a say in decision making processes. Mm -hmm. So let's follow up. Can I ask a question? You can, yeah. Does the, um, now that non-citizens can vote, I thought it was only on a local election. Yes. They don't vote on a national no. election. No, no. Not, no, not at all. Just right. local election. I mean, not great. I'm just confirming that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So let's follow up a little bit on this idea of, you know, um, local democracy, mm -hmm. all voices being heard, and then the tension that that creates, right? when maybe the ideas and the thoughts, when there's a lot of misinformation, disinformation, hate groups on the rise, a quelling of free speech, right? Uh, uh, a dismantling of some of the institutions that support our democracy, like a free press, mm -hmm. an accessible and free press. Mm -hmm. um, so talk a little bit about what your experience is, if we can bring it down to like, what's been your experience in this local political process where you have had run into difficulties or where you have had successes in a democratic process to either reach that consensus or to maybe not reach a consensus, but to protect the rights of minorities to exist. And I mean that in the, the broadest political sense, um, um, so, so maybe talk a little bit about what your experience has been in the local democratic process around these issues. Misinformation, disinformation, free speech, hate speech, the tensions that we have around democracy. Is that a big question? <laughs> Sorry. Can I say? Sure. Or, yeah. Because I'm a lawyer, I've been involved in many free speech issues. My argument is to follow always the First Amendment. If it's misinformation, get it out there. Let people decide between misinformation and real information. It is a uh, respect for free speech. Even though it makes us terribly uncomfortable, hate speech follows under the First Amendment also. It makes people very uncomfortable. However, there are a lot of things that are labeled hate speech that might not be hate speech. And there are examples in Burlington of that. Um, I believe in a full knowledge of people to hear everything. That's also a right of free speech. People should be able to hear everything and all points of view, including the truth and including the false truth. But people are intelligent. As he said, people have consciousness and they have reason. People are able to determine for themselves what truth is and what truth is not. And what's your, ex what's, what's been your experience I'll give you that. one yeah. example. Yeah. There was an example years ago, Burlington uh, Telecom and the city of Burlington was the, there were only two cities in the United States that covered Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera English is a news network from Qatar, I believe, in the uh, Arab world. And we had Al Jazeera English on the air here in Burlington Telecom, here in Burlington, because it was municipally owned. You must remember the mm -hmm. struggle, yeah. Megan. Yeah. Okay, there was an attempt on the part of uh, a group here to eliminate Al Jazeera English from our local network. The opponents to Al Jazeera English argued that it was hate speech, that it was anti-Semitic, Al Jazeera English was anti-Semitic, and that um, it was anti-US, and that it should not be shown in the United States. We had a series of hearings all over this city to keep it on the air because it's free speech. We won that, don't you remember? Uh -huh. We kept it on the air. The reason that we kept it on the air was that it was municipally owned and therefore 
um, protected by the U.S. Constitution. Uh -huh. If it had been controlled as it is now by a corporation, there's no constitutional guarantees. Except but we were be able, because we fought so. under the United States Constitution to preserve Al Jazeera English as um, a, a network which offers alternative views. Yeah. And we, that's one example. But it was labeled by opponents as a hate speech. Yeah. Other folks, um, I know this is kind of a complicated or convoluted question, but you're you know, getting into the kind of uh, difficulties around democracy. Talk a little bit about your experiences in the local political systems. Yeah. I can go. I mean, I feel that maybe you, let's start what you just said, which is really, really important in terms of who holds the media. Mm. Right. Holds, has the power of just mm -hmm. swaying people's perspective, what they want to see or don't want to see. There's also another element of those who do not even speak the language in which we use to operate and to try to find a consensus. For example, the New Americans. I think at the local level, as a New American, the first thing that I have pushed for is to create a language access plan meaning that anything happening here from those who are paying taxes, what are, are they receiving the information that we all, to ensure that we have equity, right? I think it is important for people to never undermine the power of these local media mm -hmm. such as CCTV, bringing their perspective. Anyone with any points of view can come here and basically have a say. Right? And also to share the information on an accurate level. I think also there is this element of just, you know, information des desert. What do we choose to, to cover and what do we choose to not cover? Even though we have, you know, media that are written, Seven Days, VT Digger, mm -hmm. we have WCAX, all of it, but what do they choose to cover? I think that corporate perspective of these medias and this community media, the difference is where if we want to ensure a democracy exists in a community, let's ensure that these, you know, entities are supported in order for people to express their views and also have a say in the political system. Language access is key mm -hmm. and also disseminating the right information is also key. What is hard is to just make sure that people definitely have and understanding that not all, for, not all, not all information is true. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So let me. Yes. So I'm so glad you said that because as we're having this conversation, and I mentioned that I believe for democracy to truly succeed, we have to have an agreement on what truth is, mm -hmm. effective. And you know, our government does. I, I believe in government because, in a, and again, in a shared society, we want to take care of each other. We have our government that helps to ensure safety in our food, in our air, in our water, in our drugs. So we have food labels so that people know what's mm -hmm. going into their food. Mm -hmm. We have, um, you know, the CDC and, and testing of food and we have um, regulations to ensure that food safety and when we don't have them we end up with situations like boarhead. Mm -hmm. I feel that since the 80s we've had a loss of trust in what is news. Mm -hmm. We had this proliferation of 24-hour news. We had this proliferation of echo chambers where anyone can find someone who can absolutely back up their own beliefs, mm -hmm. right? We can all find those sources of information that uh, just fortify what we already believe. I think that in order for us to have, um, again, a true democracy based on fact, we should, and you said, those who hold the media hold the power, if someone wants to call themselves a news organization, then it's incumbent on them to make sure that what they deliver is fact. Mm. Not opinion, um, not biased, but fact. Mm. If you want to call yourself an entertainment organization <laughs> who has you know, entertainers um, spouting their, their beliefs, go ahead and do it. But you know, and, and I'm going to show my age here, but I, you know, you remember when we had CBS, ABC, NBC, it was basically three news networks that we all watched. And it, and it was our, our source of truth. And they were trying to give you the facts, not just opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, not, that's not to say that bias wasn't there, because, you know, 
of course bias was there. There was bias, gendered bias, racial bias, and on and on. But we all were given the same information. <coughs> and at least they were trying to establish these are the facts. I think we need to get back to that. Mm -hmm. So that when people make their decisions, it's based on facts. So if we want to talk about a local example, let's go back to 2020. <laughs> and for the city of Burlington, after the murder of George Floyd, there was the upheaval and a call uh, to defund the police. And unfortunately, I feel that our city, um, our city failed. Our city failed, our local leaders failed. Um, we were going off of feeling and that fact. And we had a resolution pass to cut the police through attrition. Um, and of course, quickly those people who could leave, they left. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's true in any industry. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we went from feeling. Mm -hmm. We didn't think about what the unintended consequences would be. And that's because we did not go from fact. And there was an attempt to have a, a resolution to say, let's not just cut, mm -hmm. let's first do the research to see what is the right size for the Burlington Police Department. Mm -hmm. I wish that had passed. That would have been going uh, off of fact, not just the feeling. So that's, that's a challenge I put out mm -hmm. to everyone, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. We all have our feelings, we're human beings, we're going to have them. But can we temper them, take a breath, mm -hmm and say, all right, let's make sure that we're all informed and we're all moving from fact. Yeah. So I can continue from fact because now uh, on my, um, based on my experience, now it is all perspective. There is no like, okay, mm -hmm. there's no one truth and there are like multiple facts, mm -hmm. but also there are multiple perspectives mm -hmm. and somehow we talk about media and everything but not every individual is a media now like through their mm -hmm. TikTok channels, yeah, through their yes. YouTube, mm -hmm. through their posts so suddenly you know I'm a leadership professor and I teach my students yeah there's no black or white it's gray so when you are trying to find the truth just keep this in mind but now it is so much gray so it is really difficult for this generation, including my kids. I have 18 and 16. They come out, oh, mom, do you know this happened? I said, where did you hear from? From TikTok. Okay, so, <laughs> but is it reliable? This generation, they really, they really don't care about the real reliability or uh, fact check. It's the, oh, it is very nice and like fun perspective, so I can just follow it. Right, so it is great that mm -hmm. we are living in a century everybody can express their ideas, but sometimes, although in the local level, I'm also a city councilor in Montpelier, we, uh, as a city, there are lots of reports, like everything we make a decision on, it is on the website, but somehow people choose to create their own truth mm -hmm. based on, again, different perspectives. Then they, uh, we have a front porch forum, right? Then they post their perspectives. And then as a city councilor, local, uh, you know, uh, politician, I just, no, that's not truth. But what is truth, right? Mm -hmm. So it is very difficult to, now we have very wider gray area yeah. to find the truth. Mm -hmm. It is good and I don't know, uh, not good at the same time. Yeah. I have a question for the parents on the panel. <laughs> Um, you know, when I was in school, we were taught civics, mm -hmm. <laughs> how, how the American political system works. Are we still teaching our children this? There's no specific civic course, but there it's are actually history, very, yeah. It is actually one of the things in the Pew Research that the, the decline in civics education and, you know, when, when folks, when, when you're talking about perspective and truth, I, I feel <laughs> not, not I know, but I feel that this is not a new idea, mm -hmm. that disinformation and misinformation propaganda has obviously mm -hmm. propelled a lot of um, our political systems throughout the years. But that civics that, that we have in, hopefully, in a democracy, levers and mechanisms to counteract either checks and balances mm. or levers and mechanisms of free press. And so I think that's the place where I'm wondering where you see examples of that. You see examples of, of, 
of our democratic system right now being supported, even on a local level, by those um, checks against misinformation. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we, we, we are always, we are always going to move forward with perspectives. And I think it's really actually kind of amazing and beautiful that we've gotten to this time mm -hmm. where we can hear from and experience so many different perspectives and ways of being in the world. And so how do we like continue to embrace that, mm -hmm. not shut that down, but what are the mechanisms that are going to keep us, um, you know, not um, putting people in jail yeah. <laughs> because of their perspectives, not legislating people's bodies, not criminalizing behaviors or people, um, not, um, yeah, so talk a little bit about that if, if you have. I, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. When you and others obviously talk about misinformation, how, uh, what are you talking about? Are you talking about some opinion that's put out, some statistics that are put out of things that are wrong? If so, then we as citizens have the duty not to shut it down, but to counter it, uh -huh. to counter it with our version of the information. With <coughs> our, the purpose to me in a democracy is not to control uh, from the government's point of view, at least, misinformation. The purpose of it in a real democracy is to counter it Great. and to let the people decide. That's what's called freedom of speech. I worry about this labeling of certain information as misinformation. Who's labeling it that way? Isn't it the right of each citizen to see that in misinformation, if it's that, and then to um, see information and make a decision for themselves. American citizens are smart, intelligent people, as people are all over the world. And they have a right to make those judgments themselves, not to have the government shut down what the government thinks is information. That's really worrisome. Right. And that is an example of government control of free speech. So yeah. maybe it is important to bring people together so they can express their ideas. Yes. So that's why League, uh, we organize like even local uh, candidates or national. We bring, uh, because we are nonpartisan um, nonprofit, we bring people together from each side and they explain right. themselves. Uh, and people not only reading their ideas, but they can ask questions. They can say, oh, I don't exactly. think like what I didn't understand what you are saying. Could you please clarify? Also, uh, we do like a media literacy. Mm -hmm. We work with youth, and um, it's. I think it's important accessibility, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we can help people t uh, to access the information, and they can decide, right? Which yes. is right. <laughs> the good mm -hmm. information or but whatever. I don't want to label anything, and also the language barriers because uh, Americans is a diverse um, population. Uh, uh, so it is important if we wanna reach every single person with the uh, right information, then there should be no language barriers to understand and um, to, um, to um, access that information. Mm -hmm. I think Sandy's question is a good one. Yeah. Misinformation. Yeah. I, I think misinformation is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I, I, I too believe in a free press. Mm -hmm. I do believe that if you're going to be a journalist, you don't just parrot talking points from anyone. That if someone says it's raining outside and the other person says, no, it's sunny, you don't just report both. You actually go and you check the weather and you report the truth. So misinformation is dangerous. We also know that misinformation can be propaganda and it can, it can, it can lead to horrible things. Mm -hmm. So my background is that my mother is German. My grandfather was in the Hitler Youth. My father is African American. So I have generations of ancestors who were enslaved. My generational trauma is of uh, being the oppressor and the oppressed. I know what misinformation can do. We saw what happened in Germany with the Holocaust. I know what has happened here as the descendant of African Americans. 
and misinformation around who black people are. Um, I had the good fortune that my father died as an elderly black man. And I didn't know if that would be possible with the misinformation on racism that he dealt with living in the South. So it's not, I don't, I don't agree that Americans are smart in the sense to handle misinformation on their own. I think it is incumbent upon us, if we're talking about a free press, to make sure that we give them the tools they need and part of that is truth. But how do you control then the press to do that? What are you talking, I'm not uh, certain I'm, what you're saying. I'm not trying to control the press. Uh -huh. I am saying that, let's, let's talk about the last few years. Okay. Um, since 2016, we've had a devolution of political norms. We've had a lot of things in place for many years where we had expectations uh, on our leaders. And it wasn't, it wasn't written down in law, there were just expectations of political norms that you would not benefit off the presidency um, monetarily, but it happened. So I'm saying that um, I, can't, I can't force anyone to do certain things, but I think it's incumbent upon all of us as Americans to say, there are some societal norms we should all agree on. And having journalists attend to the truth and not just parrot anyone's talking points should be one of those norms. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, we all watched the national debate yes. re very recently between recent Kamala one. Harris yes, <laughs> and um, Donald Trump. And we all heard basically this amount of information from a vice president, former president, telling people that in Springfield, mm -hmm. the migrants are eating the cats, they are eating the dogs. I mean, there is nothing more hurtful than that. A president candidate, national television, I mean, providing information that are untrue. But what was beautiful about that statement is how David Menier fact-checked the former president yes. on the spot. To yeah. just say, we did our due diligence in calling the manager, town manager, but they reported that they haven't even heard of people basically mistreating animals, and now you're telling us they eat eating the animals. Where you heard it from? On the media. On the TV. Yeah. I saw it on the you TV. You see, there is nothing more dangerous, and to your point, that may, now everyone is a journalist, right? And to your point again, that, you know, who hold the truth, right? And to your point again, I mean, basically, the amendments that we have here. But people are manipulating everything in a way right to just find out. Now, I mean, I think in all of this conversation now, who holds the power? The power is held by the people. And the people, I mean, basically, because they have a say, they elect the people, they put them down from office, they have the power and people need to understand it. From my perspective, we need to, again, support these local yes. media entities, right, that are bringing candidates here, to talk about ideas, to talk about what they believe in, in how this society need to run. And from my perspective, that's where we need to focus, right? And I mean, I'm someone from Africa. I've been elected official right here in, in the city of Burlington, the biggest city in the state of Vermont. But I have seen people with power taking my words, right? tangling it in order for people to not vote for me, mm. right? I have seen it over and over. And the most recent example is about defending the police. People, I mean, really pointed the finger at me. Why did you defend the police? I'm like, no, I was actually the one who brought the amendment. Yeah. Let's study this issue. But you see, the amount of providing misinformation is very easy, right? You wake up, you have your coffee, you think about something, you balance it out, and that's it, right? But it is really hard for that person, again, to try to convey the truth, uh -huh. right? It's an ongoing mm -hmm. fight, mm -hmm. ongoing fight. And each and every single one of us, we should not let our hands down. We should continue to fight for the democratic justice and freedom for all. So, and I think each individual has responsibility yes. mm -hmm. on this too because when we buy uh, like a very 
ordinary product. We go, right? We read all the labels, uh, right. all the like uh, commands. We just check, oh, is it good, bad? We do our research, but when it is information, we say, oh yeah, this person is saying it must be true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why we mm -hmm. don't do the same process with all the things are mm -hmm. being shared, all the things we are told mm -hmm. <laughs> to receive? We don't do any uh, individual responsibility mm -hmm. when it is about the information and when it's about the truth. So, uh, yeah, sorry. please. I give you the perfect example of what I think, what Ali said, or the truth of what Ali said. Donald Trump said horrible things at that debate. Immediately, he was countered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I think it should wasn't always his last happen. Name. It's what? not. A, that isn't always happening. No, I know, but them. it yeah. but it could happen yeah. if you value freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Trump says something horrible, he's countered by other truth. Yeah. That's really, rather than controlling what is said, I mean, how could you control pres former President Trump in the first place? You can't, number one. But rather than even attempting to, why don't you just have counter speech all the time? All the time. Does, yeah, yes. where does, as much as possible. I mean, as what, much what is, as possible. I mean, I guess that's, you know, if we've gotten rid of the fairness doctrine, if we've denuded the free press, if we don't have time, who's got time to research everything, mm -hmm. right? Especially mm -hmm. when it's so much easier to just like keep scrolling mm -hmm. or work to make billionaires rich. So, I mean, I think that's, I mean, I think, you know, there are a lot of pressures yes. on being able to have that counter all the time. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time on this idea of trust, because one of the things in the Pew research is, you know, that less than 30 percent of Americans trust their government, which might be actually a good thing. Yeah. Or it might not be a good thing. But let's talk about where we need to have our trust and what that word means for you in relationship to democracy. Mm. Yep. I mean, I think in the state of Vermont, I mean, we can all give an example because it's a beautiful state, right? Um, we have a governor who is a Republican who doesn't have the majority in the assembly, right? Mm -hmm. But still, who's really loved because mm -hmm. people trust him. Right. Uh -huh. During the pandemic, we have seen his leadership. We have seen also the leadership of Mayor Weinberger. We have seen leaders that we trust, that we can convey, that we can follow. It doesn't matter what. But at the same time, there is danger from my perspective, that are all the leaders who are just trying to hold like the power, who are also trying to undermine the democracy of the state of the people. And one concrete example is just about the city of Burlington. For example, the uh, um, community oversight of the police. In so many different instances, we have seen a city council refusing to put that item on the ballot for people to have a say. And those people, those same people, went and received 5,000 signatures in order for the city council to put it on the ballot where you have seen again how they blocked it, uh -huh. right? Which item is it? The police the oversight. The police oversight, Okay. right? And, and I think, to, from my perspective, it's where the danger is. And again, the responsibility of the people is the people that you are voting into office to make a decision on your behalf. You need to take the time, study the issue, to see their voting records, in order to make sure that your democracy is 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 still intact, and it's a, it's a work of us again to do it on a daily yeah. basis. And to be clear, that is on the ballot now. Yes. Finally, yes. it will be on the ballot in November, but it was blocked. Blocked, um, and also you know the version that is going on the ballot is a version that has been watered down. Mm -hmm. It's not the version of where you know we need to move this issue forward. But no, it was watered down. And again, just a couple of people who did it. Yeah. Trust. So yeah. trust in the government. Mm. What's that word? Trust. Word. What does that mean? I think trust Maybe. is a m mutual thing, right? You cannot trust any entity or individual with a like a blind <laughs> eyes. Oh yeah, I trust you. You can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. There should be some check and balances. So they should deserve, like in democracy. I think whoever representing you should deserve your trust, right? And also, when we trust politicians and elect them, they also trust us, 
right? If we just send them to the <laughs> positions and do not say, do not do anything, when we realize something is not right, if we don't say anything, if we don't use our rights, civic rights, then it's not trust, it is something else. So for me, again, trust is mutual and it requires check and balances all the time. So even in local politics, why there is a term. Yes. This is the, mm -hmm. I trust you for another term. Mm -hmm. But as a local po or national, po we, uh, we earn that trust. So we are elected again. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is not like, oh yeah, you can do anything you want for this specific term because we trust you. It's not like that. So it is, yeah, both sides, mm -hmm. civic responsibility, and also all the things we are talking about, like ethics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That <laughs> politicians should also follow. Because democracy is not something like, oh, everybody can do whatever they want when they have a power. Mm -hmm. No, they, especially politicians in democracy, receiving that power in terms of mm -hmm. giving something back, which is truth, which is trust, inclusion, whatever, uh, you know, you can include so many concepts there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm one of those who don't trust government. Yeah. <laughs> I trust people. Mm -hmm. I trust normal people because this is why. I've taught school for many, many years. I trust the ability of people because they have intelligence and they have reason. They can be misinformed. They can be twisted in their thinking. Ultimately, we, if we agree that democracy is the best form of government, it's because we have to trust citizens to make the best decisions possible. That's why, for instance, I like direct democracy, town meetings, a lot more than the electoral process. I support the electoral process because it's better than having a monarchy. However, basically, because I trust people, human beings who can use their brains Mm. I trust people a lot more than I trust people who are in power, remember. Government has a great deal of power over us in terms of everything, really. So I trust people on a local level to make the best decisions for how we're going to live together. It's ideal. It seems hard to do these days, but yeah. not for you. But so is the maintenance of a real uncorrupt republic. Mm -hmm. That's really hard. Mm. Yeah, well, we're at risk of that right now with an unchecked Supreme Court. They, they, they don't have any checks and balances anymore. Mm -hmm. There doesn't seem to be any uh, set of ethical standards for the Supreme Court right now. And we need to remedy that because when you don't have that, then you lose trust. Let's go back to trust in our institutions. Um, I, think, I think a key component of trust, which you mentioned Governor um, Scott, Scott and the COVID response. I think the success in Vermont um, was due to, uh, yes, our trust in him um, and the transparency that was there, mm -hmm. that was delivered. Um, it was delivered here in the city of Burlington as well. Um, that was important. We heard a lot from them and they were very transparent about mm -hmm. what was happening. Uh, data was shared, facts were shared. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll say what happened here locally for the city of Burlington is we had um, uh, ver the, what was it called, Ali, um, that helped stand up uh, the health response, uh, the, the BIPOC. Response. The BIPOC. Oh. Yep. So, yep. so in, in immigrant communities and a lot of new American communities, and frankly in the African American community, <laughs> there could be distrust around um, the medical profession. We can go back to the Tuskegee. Uh, experiments on African-American folks, um, so around vaccination. And so the state, the city, put some pl things in place so that uh, BIPOC folks could have trust mm -hmm. around, okay, I'll go get my vaccination because I'm believing the people were telling me this is going to be safe mm -hmm. for me and my family. Transparency, trust. And if we wanna talk about, you know, I love, I love Vermont, I made Vermont uh, my home uh, back in 1989, I first got here in 1986 when I was a college student. Um, th and as a military kid, this is the only place that has felt like home to me. And I, I love Vermont, sp especially Burlington. Um, but if we wanna talk about local government versus state versus federal, 
I would not be sitting here today on an equal footing without Lyndon Bain Johnson, mm. without him pushing forward um, voting rights and civil rights mm -hmm. that would not have passed at a local level, mm -hmm. especially in the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we need to move um, our people forward when they may not be ready. Mm -hmm. And, and so I believe that I believe in our government here in the United States, and I appreciate that we keep moving towards our promise, even though we make steps back sometimes. Um, and that's, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll just stop yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so much more to say, but I'll stop there. Just wanted to add that since Democracy Day is an international, um, right. yeah. you know, event, right? I mean, I think from my perspective, I trust the American way of voting, de definitely. Even though January 6th, that president said, no, stand down, so, but stand back. Yeah. Something like that, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, but I think, you know, America has a lot of lesson to teach the rest of the world. We have a lot of problems, yes, that's true. And also at the same time, we have a lot of systems of government where their people do not have even a say. You know, Russia, or China or elsewhere. Even some countries in Africa, such as Mauritania, there is no way that a president who is not doing a very good job still winning by over 66% of the vote. Venezuela, we had a problem right here. But I think it doesn't matter the way in which we approach this issue. I think America still you know, is a little bit away than many other countries. And the rest of the world need to um, listen and also watch and, and, and learn and grow. Yeah, just wanted to add that yeah, perspective. Thank you. And as we're coming to kind of a close here and we're, it is the, it's election season as well. We're starting into the general election season. November will come and voting is happening. Um, my little piece of paper here says that fewer than half of college age people aren't registered to vote. Mm -hmm. And um, only about a quarter of them voted in 2022. We just went through a primary, and I think for our Chittenden State Senators in the largest county, there were maybe 4,000 votes cast total, um, and that was a contested primary. I mean, not a, a you know, it was actually a pretty, um, a yeah. pretty uh, challenged mm -hmm. contested primary. Um, so I'm wondering, voting is one thing, one way that we talk around democracy, but what are you all taking out in the next few months the next year, what's your way of engaging in the democratic process? What is something that you're going to take forward that you hope other folks would do as well, beyond voting and maybe voting as part of it? What I'm going to do is concentrate on our Bill of Rights and make sure that Americans have free speech, freedom of, to worship as they wish, a free press. That's the essence of democracy. To me, that's um, the core of democracy, and that's, those are the things I'm going to do in the next election season. And you do that through I do that through, through CCTV. Yeah, <laughs> through engaging other folks, but you also use the courts as a system. Yes, I also a use the courts. Of bringing justice. I also, and there's a very important case that's going to be pending in the courts about free speech as well, as you know. But yes, every day I'm aware of uh, violations of our Constitution, and every day we should be fighting those violations through the courts. Great. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, uh, for me, represent representation is the most important thing in democracy. And uh, you mentioned that most of the youth, they don't prefer uh, voting because they don't see themselves in the political system. They see, I'm old too, but like they see old white men, right? Talking about things that doesn't make sense to them anymore. So that's why in Montpelier, uh, we are having our first youth committee as part of the city of Montpelier. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are uh, planning to bring uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers uh, into the decision making process. Not they will take like workshops or training about democracy, local governors, they make decision about the future of at the town itself. And with League, we are doing the same thing. We are trying to get rid of the barriers uh, for people to uh, have the democracy to feel that they are living 
in uh, the system and one of the way of doing is civic en engagement like we have to support civic engagement and we are very lucky because Vermont is based on like c citizen mm -hmm. uh, politics and everything so it is great but there are so many things to do so I think representation and um, getting rid of barriers and uh, promoting civic en engagement they are like three important things and personally and part of the league we will continue working on these things. Great, thanks. Cool. Um, you know, on a personal level, it's, it's my own engagement in the democratic process. And I had the great pleasure, good fortune of being a delegate uh, to the D Democratic National Convention. And that visible participation, I will say, for my friends and family and neighbors, um, I think it makes a difference. When you see someone you know engaging in the process, you know, the questions that come to me, how did that happen? How did you make that happen? Um, so it's having those conversations with people as much as I can. I wear my politics on my sleeve, meaning I do believe in being engaged in the process and having the conversations, yes, with everybody, those you agree with and those you don't, because we're not gonna learn if we don't have those conversations. And uh, the work I do is I do user experience designing digital solutions. And one of the things I always talk about as I work with different clients is what I call the power of wrong. I've actually made my most significant advancements when I've been wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I was like, I had, I had assumptions about this thing. I was absolutely wrong. Okay, let's start over. And we end up with a much better solution than I even could have imagined. Um, so having those conversations and being open-minded to other perspectives. And then the third way for me is uh, I'm a graduate of Emerge Vermont which is encouraging women to run for office. So continuing to have those conversations and, uh, and connection with that group, I think is very important. Because you, you're right, you got it. It's, a, it's important to see people who look like you. I think it's important to have all of the voices in the room because we can't really create um, a shared uh, democracy and a successful uh, society for each other if we don't have all those perspectives in place. And let me just say this, to go to facts, companies who have a more inclusive workforce are actually more productive and more profitable. And that's just fact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, between now and election, I think, or whatever, I think from my perspective, it is an ongoing um, effort. We should never let things down because it is an election or not. I think what I will continue to do is to support this local television of bringing candidates, yeah. asking them questions, and you know, in making sure that their voters will have a different perspective or are informed before they vote. I think at the national level, I will also continue to engage people that look like me to understand the dynamics about this election and also the consequences that it may have in their future in order for them, wherever they are, to make the right decision. You know, yes, vote for Kamala Harris, but at the same time, <laughs> you just need to know hey. that this election happened. If you haven't registered, you can register. This is how you do it, and this is the age in which you or your kids can start to do it. And what are the benefits? To inform them in a way, in a language that they understand, you know, and also in a channel, which is TikTok. I like it. <laughs> you like it. You, you, yeah. it it's yeah. there. Um, but I think... The ongoing work is at the local level, mm -hmm. and especially in my neighborhood, which is a very conservative neighborhood. And as a city council, I studied a lot of great stuff about you know, connectivity and stuff like that. But there are still a lot of misinformation out there. And also to recognize the people in our community to, to do it through my social media, you know, great, doing great stuff, to remind people that you should not always wait for government. Right. But sometimes just at a very, very local level. It's my neighborhood, it's my street. Yeah. How do we bring two people together? And just talk about the smallest issue, but not the bigger one. But let's never forget the big issues, but also it needs to start and be strengthened at the local level. And that's what I will continue to do. Great. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate all of your uh, different perspectives in this, you know, trying to tackle a big topic in one hour. And thank you all for watching. Uh, CCTV will continue to do what it can do. Uh, this is our favorite season. Um
election season and we will bring you local candidate forums um, throughout September and October and then we'll have an election results show um, in on um, November 5th. Thanks. Um, thanks for tuning in and um, enjoy um, International Democracy Day.